Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Electric Underground Podcast. Joining me is a new viewer and new guest to the channel, RJB. Welcome to the show. He actually messaged me in the comment section and said, hey, can I come on the show? And I thought, hey, it would be cool to get someone new with a fresh perspective on the show because it has been a while since I've had a newer player on the channel. So welcome, my dude. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. I, I, I think it's really cool that you even you know offered to have me on uh some random person messaged you in the youtube com comments and you just bring me <laughs> on so I, th I think that's great yeah but let's just be a lesson You're gonna get in gonna, yeah i know it's like hey hey i have to be in the right mood before i'll just let it you know the floodgates are not totally open but it had been such a long time since someone had done that i thought okay th you know this is gonna be cool this it's been a long time and also because um i really wanted to talk about what you suggested too which was a new fresh faced brand new shiny eye perspective on the genre because i've been doing this for quite a while now and talking to people who've been in it for a very long time and sometimes we get a little bit lost in the weeds of our own sort of thoughts and everything so i think having a nice fresh perspective is definitely useful from time to time to keep to keep like you know on track especially since i actually have a lot of questions for you <laughs> just market yeah. research wise anyway so <laughs> I was really excited to bring you on the show. And so the first thing that I want to ask you, and this actually isn't in the outline, but it just occurred to me, is what inspired you to message me in the first place? Like what brought on that uh, that j that first initial inspiration? You know, I am generally a pretty, uh, like, you know, I, I enjoy conversation. I like topics, uh, talking with people about random things and um you know, you, I would say of the people that I watch shmup YouTube stuff, like you're definitely the forefront. And I just, I don't know. I was just like, you seem like a pretty down to earth guy. And I was just like, hey, if you ever want to have me on, just like, I don't know. Just, to, you know, <laughs> flattery so will you get seem, you, you seemed approachable. <laughs> yeah. You, you seemed approachable. Um, I like your content. So figured why not? You know, you never, you never uh, get anywhere if you don't try. Right. So. That's exactly right. Yeah, and I think people will be surprised at how... I actually, I have a funny little story about this. For people, I'm not e-famous enough yet to totally ignore the commenters. You know, maybe someday I'll, I'll be e-famous enough for that. But it, you'll be surprised what actually happens quite a bit is, you know, I'll put up a video and some of my uh, topics that I cover are kind of complicated or somewhat nerdly controversial, not like real life controversial. But if you're a nerd, you know, it might be controversial. And sometimes I'll get some sort of spicy replies in the comment section. And I'll sort of just write something back to them. And I can tell you about 80% of the time, the people are like, whoa, I didn't, you know, I didn't mean to be so mean. I just didn't know you'd actually like read and reply to the comment. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, no, I, w I will read and reply to most of the comments. So uh, yeah, definitely. I'm. A that's a really good way to get a hold of me these days. Nice. Well, good to be on. So I'm excited. you sort of prefaced your message saying that you were newer to the genre. So I want to mm -hmm. get a little bit more information on kind of your background with shmups especially your recent background so what has sort of brought in your renewed interest in the genre or maybe this is the first time you've been into them i'm not sure yeah i actually never played um i never played a shmup before maybe a year and a half ago i'd say nice and I mean, you know, maybe maybe some obscure time I played when I was a kid, you know, or some random thing, but I don't even remember it. So I definitely didn't own any um, as a kid and didn't didn't my parents never took me to arcades or anything like that. So the only times I, you know, oh, like wow. go to a pizza restaurant. So you're in an arcade. Mm -hmm. or there's like an arcade machine or two or something like that. So, you know, like play the racing game or whatever. Um, but no, I never played any shmups. And so the way that I actually saw this was i can't even remember if it was i saw something from your channel it might nice. have been <laughs> yeah when um or it was and, and this might be it actually um so the only thing that i game on right now is the switch um just because you know i'm a, I'm a, I'm a family man husband got three kids mm -hmm. i work you know so i don't have a, a, a lot of time i know the feeling and so yeah so I just I just play on the Switch and um, saw Crimson Clover. Oh, come up, nice! Right, on the eShop. Yes. And I'm like, this game looks insane. Like there's <laughs> it a, does look crazy. like a million stars falling. And I'm like, what is what even is this? <laughs> and so I looked it up, and I think that's you know I I think I found your your YouTube channel on it. 
like your review of it oh, on that's the Switch. Cool. The one where I and is so it I the one like, where I talk about like Clover Tack making the game and mm -hmm. and you're probably like, what the hell is this guy even talking about? Yo, right? Yeah, <laughs> I was. I was like, what the heck is going on with this? Is it like shmup? What is this? Is a whole genre that I didn't even know about. So yeah, I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna go for it and I'm just gonna get it and see. And it was strangely addicting. Oh yeah. Well, what a great shmup to start with. You know, that's like. That's kind of like your your very first time you have pizza and you have it in one of those like great New York restaurants and the, you know the ones that everyone says pizza is amazing in. Then you go to like Idaho maybe and you have pizza. You're like what the hell? And so that that's a great <laughs> crimson crimson clover is a great way to get into the genre. Absolutely top tier shmup for sure. And so yeah, what what was your sort of initial experience with crimson clover? So you're playing it on handheld on the Switch, right or I, no? I actually no, I docked. Oh I was okay, playing it docked. And I was playing it with, um, with like a, a pro controller. Oh, how do you feel about the pro controller, personal, like as a piece of hardware? It's a beautiful controller, but not for schmups. There you go. Because <laughs> yeah. the, the D-pad, the yes, D-pad, the D-pad from hell. Yeah, and actually, that's that's one of the things that I find the most difficult. Well, we can get into this later. We can get into like controller and yeah, arcade yeah, stick definitely. talk and stuff, but. Um, yeah, anyway, so I, I was really struggling, right? And so um, I was just like, like even on novice, I'm just like getting obliterated like stage one, right? Right. I'm like, no, I got to be better than this, right? So um, so I just like kept trying and I ended up getting um, like the 8-bit do arcade stick. Oh, that's yeah. Like, now you're upgrading. So it's, it was, it's, you know, it's not great. It's not like yeah. top end or whatever, yeah. but it's like, it's okay. Um and it's easy connect to the switch. So um, then that was like, okay, now like, you know, a couple steps forward, like 10 steps back because I'm getting used to an arcade stick for the first time because I never played on arcade stick before. So that took a little bit to get used to. Um, but now that I've been playing on the arcade stick for a while, it's like second nature. I can't play on anything else, right? Like the nice. arcade stick is it. Yeah, especially that D-pad from hell on the pro controller, that thing. I don't know what uh, happened to Nintendo. I don't know if their D-pad engineer got got assassinated by Sony or what, but the, their D-pads as of late have been pretty awful, and that surprises me. And then on the Switch, they're like, just forget the D-pad. Get that out of here. So right. it is weird. Especially that because a, the rest of the controller is so good. I know. It is weird. A company that was at one point famous for their D-pad design has really gone downhill in that regard. Right. So. It kind of had a really inconvenient time too with the switch and everything. Yeah, I agree. Because like like you've said multiple times, um, in like a lot of your stuff, there's a lot of good stuff on the switch. A lot yeah. of good shmups on the switch. Yeah, I know. The thing is that as much as I'm not a Nintendo fanboy, you cannot deny that thing is a switch or a shmup powerhouse. It's it's pretty crazy. But I will say the PS4 2 also is insane. Probably. This generation, by the time we're done with it, the Switch and PS4 will probably be the most shmup rich platforms outside of the PC. I think at this point, I mean, even the 360 stuff is making its way onto these. So I don't think, especially the PS4 with all the M2 stuff, I mean, I, I would have to say at this point, it probably ranks as my number one shmup console outside of PC. I had a PS3 and when that died, um, I got the Switch because it's a little bit more... Uh, I've my my excuse was that it was a little bit more family friendly, right? So I'm not a, like a huge Nintendo guy either. Right? But no, they definitely came up with a great product. And me, me saying that, I've owned every single Nintendo console, so I, I <laughs> I'm kind of a hypocrite <laughs> like that. <laughs> I have a Wii U and all that. Um, I do like Nintendo. Just uh, as of late, I guess I'm kind of dogging on them because as of late, I just don't think their their output has been that great compared to even a few generations ago. So. But this hardware wise, the switch is a home run for sure. That thing is an absolute beast and it has done a lot for shmups. There's no denying that. And so you're yeah. playing Crimson Clover on the switch. You got your arcade stick. You're you're cooking now. Um, what was sort of your initial goal when you're picking up Crimson Clover? Like what was the attraction towards that game initially? I don't know. I'm a, I'm definitely a, um, a more action oriented game person and I do like um like roguelite type games right where there's kind of like try again didn't work out try again oh didn't work yeah out. 
And Shmups kind of fit that, right? It's like, I mean, it, except for it's the same content over and over. Yeah. So it's like try again, try again, try again. And there's action. I'm always moving. So, um, yeah, I, I just really, I really enjoy that type of gameplay. And so, and I'm also very kind of like um, goal oriented. Like I will beat my head against the wall until I get it right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, it all just clicked with me. The initial goal was like, okay, I want to one CC this on novice. Like that was that was the original goal. Yeah, well, uh, I'm glad you, I'm glad you say that. As far as like ha- wanting to engage with the game, as far as being goal oriented, trying to achieve something in the game, because that's something that shmups, I think, especially these days, are uniquely suited for. That you really are going to struggle to find in a lot of more mainstream style games now unfortunately and i'm not just saying that trying to be a hipster because as of late i've been sitting and thinking like "Eh, maybe you know it's been a hot minute since i've covered a mainstream game on the channel maybe i'll find one that interests me and cover it and i'm having a hell of a time finding something (laughs) as far as like because the game's just really you're either just like for instance i was going to cover final fantasy uh, seven remake on the channel because I'm like, okay, this will annoy a certain amount of my viewers, which might be fun. Nick could also bring a new set of viewers in, or I just kind of felt like doing something a little different. But I mean, I couldn't. I the, the RPG defeats me as far as patience. I played through the like an hour or two of the game, like, all right, we're good, <laughs> we're set. Did you play so the I, original? No, like, I, was, I was playing the remake. No, I mean, like way back when did you play the original? on and off i've never cleared it but i've played it on and off for years i've run into the same problem with almost every single jrpg except chrono trigger and super mario rpg i play those quite a bit but as far as like all the final fantasies up you know old school and new school all the new uh, jrpg stuff i have the same problem where i play it for about three hours four hours and i'm like okay we're good you know i'm done here like i need i need my you know i need more i need more from you game i need more stimulation so that's what i'm saying you're like you're like you need that action yes exactly yeah i mean i even run into that with like dark souls and stuff too because i was like well dark souls that seems like that might be a little bit more up my alley but at sometimes even the pacing of that game can feel a little slow that's why i like to actually neo a lot more and then the problem is when i start playing those style of games then i just start saying well why don't i play Bayonetta or why don't I just play some Ninja Gaiden for the five billionth time so I always run into that too where I start off playing Dark Souls two hours later I'm playing Ninja Gaiden 2 again so yeah I really wish I could get a little bit more into these other genres but it's a real struggle for me and so I don't know if this could be sort of an opportunity for shmups and this is one I want to get your perspective on do you Mm -hmm. feel like you have this itch as a gamer that just is not being scratched anymore or is it just sort of coincidence you came across crimson clover no i i actually think that's a really good question because um it's true now that when i try to play games outside of the shmup genre right like they'll hold my attention for maybe a little bit and then i just find myself like yeah maybe i should try another you know go on Paji resurrection prior you know so it's like I do I do struggle to have my attention held by other game genres now and I don't know I don't know why that is I don't know if Smups did this to me <laughs> well that is true they will do that to you I mean I'm, I meant to ask like prior like okay the day you're going through the steam shop and looking for games and you come across uh, Crimson Clover like mm-hmm. what were you looking for gameplay wise were you looking for s- sort of like an arcade style game or are you just sort of open to whatever you- you'd come across or were you looking yeah, for something else open. and Crimson Clover like got in the way? No, I was just oh, I was just kind of open and looking at things and I saw like, you know, the screenshot of this ridiculous amount of stuff happening. I'm like, <laughs> how does anybody see what's happening in this game? Right, yeah. And that's that's the initial like feel of the game too. You're like, how how am I supposed to know what the hell's happening here? But you play it and you just get the feel for it and then you realize like, wow, this game, particularly Crim- Crimson Clover. Like the way that the bullets are layered and the metals are coming like yeah it's i know really it's, well it's, designed yeah like, it's very well fabulous done. yeah i think um people underestimate because it is such a busy looking game but i don't think what people understand is that 
that visual feedback of all the stars exploding, all the fireworks, all the crazy stuff happening, that's a, a reward system in itself for mm -hmm. the people who play shmups. It's like, oh yeah, like that's a reward just as much as the points themselves. And so I find myself nowadays when I play shmups always thinking like, oh, this could use a few more explosions. This could use some more <laughs> stuff flying out of it. And whenever indie developers like send me things and give me my advice, one of my most common things is like, add more stuff, add more explosions, add more, you know, add more visual feedback to your game because that's, oh, I don't know, that just really makes it feel a certain way. And I think Cave and, uh, well, um, Clo Crimson Clover isn't Cave officially, but it's like definitely Cave I mean, in, yeah. in design. It's in that wheelhouse. In it? that wheelhouse, absolutely. And I think that style of shmup, like Cave has really nailed down and uh, a lot of lessons can be learned there for sure. I agree, actually. I like out of everything that I play now, right? Well, I still love Crimson Clover. I still think it's, I mean, it might be the best that I've played still, but um, you know, all the cave stuff that, that I've picked up, mm -hmm. Mushihimi Sama yeah. is, is great. Yeah. Esbraid, Esbkaluda 2, um, I just got Death Smiles. Like these are all great. I know, it's crazy how much of them are ending up on the Switch. I think a reason for it too is just stuff seems to sell on the Switch. I mean, I can't, know that for sure but just judging by things it seems like for a, the first time in a long time shmups are moving sales wise on this platform so i could see why uh developers really target the switch for shmups in that sense too like why crimson clover came to switch first i think they mm -hmm. knew like oh we're gonna get more sales initially on the switch and then when we bring it to steam we got to worry about you know supporting the pc side of things and figuring out the pricing and all that sort of stuff so I can see, in Rolling Gunner, same thing. So I can, you can see a trend of this happening quite a bit where shmups seem to be making their way to the Switch right out the gate. I have a question for you, actually. This is my podcast now. <laughs> You're taking over, the takeover. <laughs> um, so one thing that I was thinking about in terms of, so all of these, all of these games, right? I don't know if all of them had novice modes to begin with, but many of them have novice or mm -hmm. super easy or whatever they're called yeah, modes, yeah. which I think is fantastic for new players because it gives you a potentially achievable 1cc to get you hooked in there. Kind of in the same vein as like fighting games, right? Where there's like there's almost like a gatekeeping situation there. It's like mm -hmm. The arcade mode is so hard, right? <laughs> yes. And that's just, and that's just like that's normal mode, right? Yeah. And then you have, you have like, you know, they name them ridiculous things like baby and yes, super. Yeah. E yep. And I feel like the modern gamer, right? And we we could get in all sorts of psychology and stuff on this, right? You know, definitely. I'd be interested a lot to of talk people about that. tend to utilize gaming not necessarily as a pastime but also somewhat as in like an escape people have like you know ego issues and stuff like that so yeah. you start calling something super easy or uh -huh. baby mode or whatever you want to call it and it immediately turns people off and then they quit and they don't want to play anymore whereas if you called that normal and then arcade was hard mode or whatever i think you could get more people and they wouldn't be so turned off and like you know hurt by the idea that oh i have to play baby mode to win Yes, I, I, I've actually, I think I mentioned this in some M2 review at some point, somewhere, <laughs> somewhere, but I agree 100%. They need to change these naming conventions because they're, they're, they're not, they're not good. Like you're saying, because what will happen is players come in and you can't like, okay, you clear novice mode. You can't like walk into the living room and be like, yo, I beat novice mode. And everyone's like, really? You beat novice mode? <laughs> right. Or on social media, you're like post novice mode bitches you know it's just not it doesn't have that ring to it and mm -hmm. uh, what's funny is like cave have they like figure it out and then they forgot that they figured it out like they figured this out with death smiles with rank one two three and then mm -hmm. it defaults to rank one so everyone's like oh crap i beat death smiles you know on rank one but that doesn't it's more obscure towards it being easier than you know baby rank or whatever it is or super easy mode. And I think what's funny is it's actually, I think a little bit of if M2 had a proper localization team, they wouldn't make this mistake because I think it is a little bit like trend, not translation technically, but like cultural translation misunderstanding. 
where they sure. think super easy sounds like super easy, you know, and they're, they're Japanese and Japanese t- seem to have a more like realistic reflection of their own skills and stuff like that. So th- like Japanese people will be like, oh, I love super easy mode and be fine with it. But like Westerners, we have much bigger egos, so we're not going to go for super easy mode. Yeah, those definitely should be changed to something a little bit more obscure and it should sort of default to them. A good example of this is Don Marco Limited 3 has spirit mode and yeah. what's the other version? Spirit mode and graze mode? mode. Graze mode, that's it. Yeah, and then there's there's so many difficulties. Yeah, spirit and graze mode. There you go. That's the correct way to do it. Where spirit mode is the easy mode or the easier mode for sure. I mean, there's no denying that. You get the bullet cancels mm-hmm. and then you get the auto bombs and everything like that. But it's also really fun. I actually prefer playing spirit mode over graze mode. Yeah, me too. I, I prefer I prefer spirit mode. That was another... That was um, Danmaku Unlimited 3 Easy 1cc, which is still really hard in my opinion. But <laughs> Yeah, Dan 3 little, uh, little, has a little more teeth in the easy modes than um, mm-hmm. like novice crimson clover does or the novice cave modes do yeah i think that that is a really good shmup for people to study as far as like difficulty selection difficulty curve all that sort of stuff i think that game really does a lot of that stuff right Mm-hmm. i agree i was gonna say that game once he's seeing that when i finally got that that was like my my peak that that was like one of my gaming peaks i would say it was like it was felt so good and yeah. I think that one CC was what ultimately solidified for me. Like, okay, this is a genre that I'm going to stay with. Well, that's, yeah, that's cool because I was really, that was one of the first shmups I was really into as well. And uh, I think what's fun about Don Maculum to 3 is that, like, the stages on easy mode are pretty nerfed, but the boss fights are, like, not as There's... nerfed as you would think. <laughs> so you yeah. still have to kind of struggle on those bosses, even in easy mode. And especially the the final boss. Yeah. Even on easy mode is still like you got to learn the patterns. You got to practice a little yes, bit because yeah, you're not going to. Absolutely. Gonna, yeah. I, I love but there's it. something about weaving through those patterns that is just like, I don't know, it, it hits a different chord with me. And it's really, I think, why bullet hell and it is feels so good. I don't know. Cave feels so good, right? Yeah. I think Don Mockingwood 3 does a great job of fusing cave and toho style shmupping together because it has a lot of elements from it that are very toho and then it has a lot of elements of it that are very cave and it sort of brings them together in a really cool fusion i do think uh people should uh, take it a little bit more seriously than people do but it's a very very cool game so definitely another great one to have on the switch for sure and i actually played a lot of the switch port because i it was i played on hand i played on handheld mode all the time for a long time because it was one of the early bullet hells on the switch before we got mm-hmm. all the cave stuff and you know, i had to get my bullet hell in so i was playing a lot of dan 3 for quite a while on the switch were you using joy cons no i was using the setup that i have but instead of the this blip pad pro hadn't been out but the hori d-pad was still was out pretty early so i had the japanese hori d-pad and then a stupid joy con on the right side but at least i had the d-pad then again nice. though since you're playing uh horizontal you know it didn't because my flip grip you know i i don't think it works all that great um i had to like put my face right up to the console like right on my face to play it dodge some of those bullet patterns that's a good question too because you um you know so we already talked about like i got arcade stick and you obviously are a big arcade stick guy like do you think that having an art so for for a novice schmup player right do you think that having an arcade stick to play versus not is important. And then follow up to that is when you have a low or medium end arcade stick versus, you know, putting that that Samitsu lever in there or whatever and mm-hmm. the good button. Like, how much of a jump up again is that? That's a great that's a great question because I think like the 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 I guess technical answer is no as far as do you need an arcade stick no technically you don't because there are an insane amount of players who are incredibly talented on pad like to a Mm. stupid degree and uh, unfortunately i had this whole theory for a long time that you couldn't you literally couldn't play shmups on 360 pad i was like no it's impossible it's pointless you're you know you're really hurting yourself and then of course gus comes along and like clears futari ultra on a freaking 360 pad 
So I was like, oh, okay. So that, that whole theory is out the window. Jamers plays on a Saturn pad. But I will say that I think there is a sort of element to learn get to getting a stick though that is worthwhile because it it's sort of a buy-in into the genre in a real physical tangible way that you can't quite get if you just sort of play with your pro controller or anything like that for, for example when i got into fighting games you know I, for a while i was playing on the d-pad on the ps3 and everything like that and like technically you that's perfectly fine a lot of pro players play on d-pads especially on playstation pads so i could have just stayed on the pad but i felt like i needed a little bit more buy-in into the genre you know a little bit more of a physical way to get into the genre so i got myself a cheap hori arcade stick this was my very first one it was wasn't great but it wasn't horrible but it wasn't like saimitsu or sanwa or anything like that it was one of their own crappy prior proprietary ones and i think that step can be a useful step forward for people because you have this sort of dedicated peripheral that you're using for shmups. It sort of sets the genre apart in your mind. You have this sort of physical thing hanging around reminding you, hey, you know, you're not playing shmups recently. Look at the dust here. You know, you need to get back to it. So I think in a lot of ways, I would I would definitely say if you want to sort of get yourself a little bit more invested into the genre, getting an arcade stick is a good way to do that. And also, they're just awesome. So there's that. <laughs> And, uh, really fun. Yeah, I and I play everything on Arcade Stick. I, like, I went so full Arcade Stick, I don't play anything on Arcade Stick unless it forces me to play on a pad. So, like, all 2D stuff at all, I play on Arcade Stick. I only play on pad for, like, purely you have to have two analog sticks type of thing mm -hmm. going on, like a Neo or Ninja Gaiden or whatever. But anything outside of that, I'll I will get out the Arcade Stick for. I find that having the arcade stick makes me more likely to also play like a beat em up or right yeah you know, it gets you thinking and because it's an arcade peripheral so you're like crap i need an right. arcade game to go with it exactly yeah so were you interested were what genres were you into you mentioned roguelite what other genres were you into prior to uh getting into shmup um i played some rpgs um I would play, I would play things, you know, like, well, my old gaming days were like real-time strategy. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so like Age of Empires type stuff. And we, Brood I, War? I'd, I had a friend that I'd play. Any Brood War? I didn't play StarCraft. Oh, <laughs> I love StarCraft mm -hmm. Brood War. That was like my favorite game before Shmup. Maybe there's a some sort of common thread that we're not finding here. It's well, like I do all know. These on no. a really old episode of the podcast, I interviewed Prometheus, and he he's a really talented shmup player, and one of the main sort of inspirations for me getting into the genre, and he was really into Brood War, and so we had, I was like, oh, this is a thing. I was like, oh, this is a thing. Shmup players love Brood War, but it was really just, I think, me and him. <laughs> I don't think there's a huge crossover, but uh, now you're the third. You can join the crew of the RTS to shmup fans. I mean, you think there's like a... <laughs> There's a lot of frenetic movement. I mean, yes. if you're playing RTS as well, right? Like you're all yeah. over the place. And, and so you, there's I, that you know. space control too. Like you're, there's some points in Brood War where you get out the siege tanks and stuff. It feels a little shmup like. You get out the siege <laughs> tanks, you get out the the carriers, and you're covering the the sea and the land and the air. Especially if you play Terran. Yeah, I don't know. It gets a little shmup feeling at times. <laughs> so, right. plus there's uh, if you don't know, there's Mission Craft, the greatest shmup of all time. Which is a uh, ROM hack of uh, uh, I think it's Strikers One. It's either Strikers One or Two using Brood War sprites. So you can, I'm definitely going to cover that on the channel soon. But that that's, that's just a fun idea. So it's a literal Starcraft map. You have so much more knowledge in this area than me. <laughs> that's fine. I will be lost I, in that conversation. Yeah, that's fine. But so you were more into like Age of Empires. I think that game's really fun. Uh, so did you play competitively? Uh, we play, you know, um, we played online, but not competitively. I never did any real competitive gaming, so mostly just things. Yeah, and you know, more recently, lighter things. You know, Mario, Zelda, you know, stuff like that. Which and I would play of random Mario's things and Zelda's? Like the old school ones, or are you playing more like the uh, the more recent 3D one? Um, both. I I really loved uh, uh, Mario as a kid. And so having all of these ports on the Switch, right? Like they had um, the 3D All-Stars port so you could play Mario oh, 64. Yeah, could, yeah. 
Yeah, you, um, there's obviously Mario Odyssey and there's some of the Wii U 2D Mario stuff coming. So there's a ton of different Mario games that you can play now on the Switch. So Do they just, have Mario 3 on there yet? They don't. <laughs> well, maybe maybe like Nintendo Online or whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. I think they might have virtual console. Well, Nintendo and their virtual console, it's a uh, it's uh, it's hot and cold. They'll give it they'll give it to you on one and then on the next one they'll take it off again and then the next one they might bring it back again. I'm just keeping a running tally of how many times I've bought Mario 3. I Once I hit like 20, <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do, but I've bought that game so many times now. Uh, it's just funny. Oh, so good, though. It is. Well, it's my favorite Mario game. Um, yeah. I actually just did. It's going to come out on the channel here soon. I'm, I'm going to do the commentary for it. But I just did a no death warpless clear of that game. And that was surprisingly way more of a time sink than I thought it would be. I thought I'd sit down and be like, oh, you know, I'm a pro. I'm Check pro at this out. stuff these days. Let me let me bust this out. Well, the game is like an hour and a half long if you don't warp. And then it has all these nasty little traps that, that can get you, like the fish that eats you in stage three or whatever, or land three. So it took me three days and about like nine hours of attempts to finally get the thing. But it was actually a lot of fun. But but anyway, so we're talking about um, so you're into RTS, you're into um, platformers, 3D platformers, mm -hmm. any yeah. arcade genres that really stood out to you. When I was a kid, I loved the um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 arcade beat 'em up. Oh, that's a good one. That was on NES. I mean, I played the heck out of that thing when I was a kid. Um, so I really loved beat 'em ups as a kid, but. Um, you know, I don't, it, it's weird how you kind of go away from some of these things that you really, really loved. Yes. And so I hadn't. But then once I got the arcade stick, you know, then Fight and Rage and Streets of Rage 4, I got both of those. Which great. Both great, great games. Fight yeah. and Rage is fantastic. Yeah, that's my favorite. You know, what's funny is uh, there's some controversy among my fans of, on the parry system where some of them, like myself, love the parry system. We're all about the parry system. Then other people are like, I hate the parry system. It's stupid. I wish there was a block button. What do you think? Would you do you like the parry system or do you, would you prefer a block? Oh my gosh, I can't even <laughs> say that. <laughs> I haven't I haven't played it enough yet. I mean, I've played it enough to see that it's really really deep. But um, you know, I, I play too many shmups to have enough yes. time. <laughs> yes, that's true. And the thing about the parry system is like. Uh, you really do need to sit down and practice it like a fight. That Maybe that's why I like it. You know, it kind of reminds... Well, it's definitely inspired by Third Strike. And so you really will have to go into training mode and, like, learn the enemy's strings and parry their strings like in a fighting game. I think that's mm -hmm. the coolest thing ever. I love that. And I, I prefer that over, like, just standing and blocking things and stuff. So I, I love the parry system in that game, but... Uh, that was interesting. I mean, Some I think are, anything that increases the skill ceiling, right? I think that's cool. Yeah, definitely. I guess it's just sort of a different style of beat em up. A, a rare one. There's really not a lot of beat em ups like it. Maybe that's why I like it so much, where it's so fast paced and you can. There's supers and parry. It's like a fighting game beat em up mesh that works so well. Yeah, the combat system is really deep compared to a lot of other ones. Mm -hmm, I agree. So you've been. Uh, work in the arcade stick what are you have the 8-bit uh 8-bit dough are you thinking of upgrading that are you invested enough to do that yet are you still kind of i'm cool i'm thinking it about is? it yeah <laughs> no i'm i'm thinking about it i'm because my action so when i play something like esperate mm -hmm. i have the hardest time with that game because trying to get small movements oh, out yeah. of the arcade stick is like you know you're trying to do and then you do this and then you hit a bullet and you're done. <laughs> yeah so it's like there's some and i'm not sure if it's the port or if it's the game itself or if it's the arcade stick because i don't always have to because like Espaluda, i don't Espaluda 2 mm -hmm. don't have that issue like i can get real nice little movements but Esperade, no well Esperade so. is a little bit of a funkier shmup just in itself movement wise i don't know why cave made it that way but they did it, like it the the movement in that game is a little bit funky like the way they lean and stuff the hitbox moves around in kind of a funny way and so that That's can true. be part of it and also part of it is 
like the way the concentrated shot works in that game is a little bit funky too where if you want like a true concentrated shot what you should do is you should do rapid concentrated and then the special shot and then then you get that more like clean movement slow down movement out of it i i there's just a lot of like once you get the hang of it i love the the movement of the game it's you can get like real technical with it but initially it is kind of a funkier feeling shmups so that could be part of it but it also could be like the input lag from your stick it could also be just your stick's parts are a little bit more spongy i'm, I'm not sure uh, they definitely are yeah like you can tell like even now from when i got it it's getting a little a little too much play yeah well i had mm -hmm. an old Har hori arcade stick that was one of those cheaper ones where i took it apart one day and looked at it it was like rubber on the inside and then it was like plastic and the micro switches were just like built into it in a weird way it wasn't anything that you see on like a sanwar or Samitsune. after a while that thing i just had to had to upgrade and so like once i made the upgrade i was like oh this is a big jump in quality so it depends on the thing about arcade sticks when it comes to sort of the price ranges of them is the, the law of diminishing returns is like really, really real with arcade sticks where if you go from like a cheap, really cheap one to a standard, really good one, that's like a massive jump. It's like a massive mm. improvement quality. But then when you go from like the $300 stick to like the $800 stick or the $1,000 stick, it's like very microscopic <laughs> improvements. But uh, so I think that's something to keep in mind. But that first leap from sort of like the 8-bit do to like a proper hori stick or whatever that's going to be a real nice improvement i think okay see that kind of answers the question we can back you know like 20 minutes ago or whatever so yeah I, I think that's that's good i think that's good for people to know too like if if you're trying to get into shmups and you're having a hard time yeah maybe the arcade stick arcade stick jump is going to be helpful yeah, well, it is, it's a sort of a double-edged sword because, like, especially compared to playing on some crappy old D-pad or whatever, it's going to be a huge improvement, just technically speaking. But mm -hmm. you have to learn to play an arcade stick. So you have to, like, learn two things at once. You have to learn to, you know, chew gum and run at the same time, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, yeah. When I made the transition arcade stick, I just died over and over. Yeah. It was, like, it was totally awful. And you kind of have to push through that wall. Like, you have to know that, okay, yeah. eventually I'm going to get it. Yeah. Yeah, and I, my advice has been that maybe what you want to do is you start playing more familiar games before you full like you play shmups, but then when you start getting frustrated, you like bust out Donkey Kong Country or like a game you're familiar with and play it on stick too. That way you're not fighting the game as much. You can really focus on the arcade stick. That I think that's a very useful strategy to learning the stick is like you you play it in the game, but then also you take a break and play it in like easier games that you're familiar with just to get those built into your hand a little easier. I think that's a really good, uh, really good tip. Yeah, because I know a lot of people, Not especially I did, who like I get arcade sticks and then they're trying to learn like Tekken Korean back dashes and wave dashing as like the right. first thing. That's like, you know, that's a huge leap in difficulty. And what's funny is I actually had to learn how to Korean back dash and wave dash on a pad. Even though I had a stick, I had to learn how to do it on the pad first and then translate those movements over to the stick. Because I couldn't just initially learn it on the stick. So at the point you're at now, how do you feel about, you know, like these novice modes and things? Like, is that just like I jump in, like I jump in and I just like clear it no problem. It's so easy. Oh, I never or do play you them. Still... <laughs> I like never play them. I uh, the only one that forced me to play it was Rolling Gunner because that game is so freaking hard that even I was like, whoa, okay, I need to play the novice mode a little bit here. But like all the super easy modes and all that stuff, I never play those modes anymore. I jump right into arcade. But that's sort of like... just a fluency in the genre. As you improve in the genre. That that'll become more and more natural to the point where you don't need to uh, need to play the earlier modes. But at the same time, I think they're very useful to have in there. And uh, there's no shame in learning the early modes first, because what's going to happen when you first get into the genre of shmups is you're going to have that wall of difficulty that you just feel like you can't get across ever. And getting more in time in the genre, playing those early easier modes is a really good way to move towards 
getting past those difficulty walls. Yeah, I was going to say, I think that um, there's a huge discrepancy actually in the difficulty in those novice modes, depending on what game you play. <laughs> yes, no so, standardization at all. No, and it's actually kind of frustrating because when you when you do something like like okay, Esperade, that novice mode was like first try, no miss for me or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Like it was just they, they it, went a little they went a little overboard on that one. Yeah, it's just so ridiculous. <laughs> and then you go to something like um you know crimson clover novice mode which is not that easy to clear yeah that one's one really speed. really well done i think that's one of the better ones yeah or the fun one is you at you go into s i did this for a few years you go into sdoj and you accidentally select expert novice mode and so it's like still hard you're like oh my god how hard is this game because that game has a hidden difficulty where if you choose the expert ship, it also changes the difficulty of the mode. Amushi yeah. Misama has that actually too. If you go to ultra novice mode, that's kind of a fun time. It's harder than arcade mode or about as hard as arcade mode. I just got my Mushi uh, novice 1cc. So. Were, were you, uh, did you see the ultra novice mode? I did not. <laughs> I think it's. I think it's in the switch port. I'll have to double check. But. I think no, I think it is. Um, I just didn't. I was like, you know, I'm just going to do this thing. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. find out. Yeah, I can't remember what the original novice mode feels like. Mushi is an interesting one because each difficulty mode actually changes the style of the game a bit. So like if you play normal Mushi mode, it's a Toplan style game. It's like an old school style bullet hell or shmup where it has like faster bullets, but less bullets. It's like more old school then you go into maniac then it becomes cave bullet hell and then you go into ultra and that's like you know cave bullet hell on crack but uh actually the difficulty between the normal and maniac is not a huge difference but they're uh they're different styles so i actually struggled a little bit with mushi original difficulty over the maniac difficulty for a little bit there because i was more used to the bullet hell style than the like fast uh toe plan style I find that style to be really difficult. The the fast moving bullets. Yeah. Because I think that there's right, like you you get the ability once you've played for a little while, like play shmups for a little while. I couldn't do this in the beginning, but I can now. You start to be able to see the patterns shift and yeah. where holes might develop. And so when you have bullets that are moving slow enough in something like um I mean, Crimson Clover is kind of like this. Don Mako Unlimited 3, definitely. Mm -hmm. Like, you can kind of make your way to the places where you need to be um, without having seen the pattern before. And yes. you might be able to get through it. But Mushi is like, everything's moving so fast that you can't, like, if you've not seen that pattern before, you're probably just going to die. Yeah. Or I remember the first time I played, have you played any of the Raiden games yet? I haven't. I, I really want to get Raiden 4. So I, I was playing, I don't know if they have aces yet on the Switch or not. They It's on the 360 and it's my favorite Raiden port. I love the Raiden Fighter Aces series. And I remember when I was first playing that, like getting just obliterated by it. And this was when I was like much more familiar with the genre. This was like last year or something. So I wasn't like new to the genre and I was just getting absolutely obliterated over and over and over. And I was like, how am I getting beaten so badly? <laughs> And I learned that actually the way you have to play those fast bullet hell style shmups is sort of a different approach than to a, a traditional bullet hell. Like the way you have to manipulate the bullets and stuff is different. For example, at least in Raiden, what I found was like in a cave game, like sort of sitting center screen is always sort of a good idea in a lot of cases because it gives you nice screen control. You can suppress everything down. You can make sure everyone's behaving themselves. And then you have space to move around, up and around bullets and stuff. So that's always kind of like your default position in a in a cave game. But I've, I was finding in like those faster bullet games like Raiden's and Psychos and stuff that being on the sides of the screen can actually be really beneficial too because like you sort of need to... I explained this in the Raiden video a little bit better than what I can remember, but you sort of need to manipulate the bullets into like more extreme angles than you do in that way you get more time to see the bullet right so 
for example, right? Like in Raiden, you're sitting in the mid center screen. There could easily be a ship that spawns like from the side of the screen and shoots you and you have like one second to respond to that. Whereas in a cave game, they don't really do that the same way. Right. Right. So like in Raiden, like there's there's times where like you want to just hold on to the you want to push up against the side of the screen and then you're you're doing suppressive fire on the let's say the right side of the screen so you're killing anything that's spawning on the right and then everything that's spawning on the left they have to shoot diagonally at you and then you get a little bit more time to see those bullets coming at you uh so it is it is interesting i think there is a little bit more memorization though you do need to actually know like where where they're going to spawn where they're going to shoot you but like even the way you approach the sort of basic setups and stuff is different between the two styles i think uh oh you had I... said before oh, no no, no sorry that was just me thinking oh okay you had said before <laughs> that um between death smiles and death smiles 2 you actually prefer death smiles 1 you don't really like death smiles too much absolutely <laughs> of the two which one do you think is more beginner friendly? Because I'll, I'll tell you what I think, but then I want to I want to hear your opinion. Oh, I I don't know because I only play Death Smiles two a little bit, and that could the problem is is that I play it's like one of those issues where I play Death Smiles one so much that I just know the game like mm -hmm. I know the game really well. So to me, it's like everything's obvious. Like oh, they spawn here, you go here, but probably. Objectively speaking, Death Smiles 2, because Death Smiles 1 has a very complicated control scheme where you have like all these different buttons, you need to know how to man manipulate them, you need to know all the different ways the things spawn. I think it is probably the harder of the two games as a new player, but that's just a guess. I actually don't know. So what was your experience with it? Yeah, that's that. <laughs> Death Smiles 1. <laughs> So, okay, okay, so Death Smiles 2, um, like you said, it's a little simpler in terms of the gameplay. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a really good introduction, actually. We're, you were talking about Don Maku and Limited 3 earlier as being a really good introduction for Bullet Hell. I think Death Smiles is actually a really good introduction to Bullet Hell as well, because you get a lot of shifting patterns. The patterns can be fairly dense, right? but they're not really fast moving. Yeah. And you can kind of maneuver your way and so that that one cc wasn't bad at all um but i still haven't one cc uh the original death smiles there's so many situations like you said where <laughs> yes th there's co things coming from places and like i'll be over here because i'm like okay i'm trying to like avoid this stuff and then something comes from right here and just hits me yeah you know what i mean and or one of the ravens or whatever is going to shoot a bullet that's actually kind of fast and you don't see it and so yeah there's a lot of those little instances where you kind of need to know where things are coming from otherwise you can get easily sniped and you just you know plus there's the final stage the castle where cave was like eh, give us your quarter now because it's like a <laughs> massive jump in difficulty compared to the other stages it is <laughs> they're a just huge like huge jump yeah they're like oh, no just pay up already because i remember even initially playing on rank one, I was like, whoa, this stage is pretty wild as far as all the different stuff it throws at you. And it also uh, challenges you to do this maneuvering that's very just death smiles where you need to be able to shift around your option in all these complicated ways that you don't mm -hmm. really need to do in the other stages. So yeah, I could see that being a, a, a nice jump in difficulty for sure. Yeah, and if the last stage doesn't get you, the final boss is brutal. Oh, oh yeah. A, a huge tip for that final boss that uh, is a little bit hidden tech here is if you save up, so don't spend your hyper on that section going into the final boss. You know, the one where it's like those dancers or whatever. As right. tempting as it is to hyper there, hold on to that hyper for the boss because if you hyper him, uh, like a little bit into his... The first or the second? The first one. Oh. The first the okay. first phase of it. Uh, if you hyper okay. him, uh, that cuts down on his nastier patterns at the end because his mm. end patterns are ruthless. And also, if you don't bomb him ever, so you just don't ever bomb him, you get two extra extends from him. He'll drop an extend item with two extends. So that's the secret on that guy. Yeah, that's a huge like, whoa. <laughs> 
because you can save yourself. It, it, it's a run breaker or maker. Like if you get that extend item, you're like you're good. You're good to go. And if you don't get yeah. the extend item, you can still make it, but it might be a little dicey. So there's been yeah, some. I've had some fun runs where you've done some funny strategies where, you know how if you take physical damage in the game, you lose half a bar. Yeah, yeah. So I had this one run. It was a rank three. I think it was my very first rank three clear, where I had one bar left, and it was during that one of the more difficult patterns the one where he flies around and there's all these bullets everywhere um well that's all the patterns but he like flies around at you sort of tracks you and uh what i did was i rammed into him and lost half the bar but during the invulnerability of the of that uh ram i point blanked him and killed him and got the extend <laughs> item so that's a little trick you can do on that on that boss too is all, all else fails because if you hit a bullet it'll take your whole bar but if you like ram into him specifically you can point blank him so uh that's a little tip too but yeah the final boss in death Miles is a tough one and there's no yeah. way to train against it without maim or whatever so that's also tricky too yeah and the switch version does have um you know like a, a training mode but mm. you can't just do the final boss you have to I like know. go through the entire stage i know and cave why? Because Cave on all the other ones doesn't do that. Like all the other games Cave did on the 360, they had boss selects, but on Death Miles they didn't, and I never understood why. So Cave is not anymore like making anything, right? Is that right? Mobile shmups, it seems. That there's this one mobile shmup that they work on almost constantly, it seems. Uh fun fact, the de the uh DLC characters in the Death Miles port. They're from that mobile shmup that Cave works on all the time, but it's like, why are they not making any more <laughs> like proper shmups if they're if they're still around and doing things? I think, from what I understand, that the mobile market for shmups in Japan is like insane lucrative, and so uh, they're like making way more money doing that these days than they were, you know, making proper arcade style shmups and everything, which is a shame. That's too bad. Yeah, no, yeah, that's it, too it bad. Is a shame. Yeah, so I don't know if we'll ever see another cave, like, you know, uh, Mushimisama sequel or another cave shmup, proper cave shmup, maybe, but hasn't looked that way for a very long time, unfortunately. But oh, you will get people who, so like, good. branch off of cave and do stuff. Like, Rolling Gunner, from what I understand, had some cave staff involved in that. Yeah, I haven't played Rolling, Rolling Gunner yet. Ah, that's one you gotta pick up. That one's on the Switch. That was one of the OG Switch shmups, because... It initially came out on the Switch, and the, if you wanted to play it on the PC, you had to order it physically from Japan and from like this little website and everything. But you could get uh -huh. it on the uh, Switch eShop. So for a long time, people were playing Rolling Gunner on the Switch, and I think uh, they had a the, one of the reasons DLC I have on the picked, Switch for a while too. One of the reasons why I haven't picked that up is because I was unsure how the Rolling Gun worked. Like I was like, do I need Twin Stick for this? Like what? Is, I think how is what's this? funny is in the dlc you do so like in the dlc mode you use you use like the right analog stick or something but mm -hmm. in the traditional mode no you don't it's it's all analog controls you played on an arcade stick and everything but i won't lie it is a very technical game as far as controlling that rolling gun that is part of the appeal of it like it's there's nothing quite like it controlling that thing but it is it is tough it's a hard one it's one of the hardest shmups i've ever played Oh, wow. It does have a novice mode, though. That's really good. But that novice mode is pretty tough, too. And I haven't played Ikaruga either, because I'm not a huge fan of puzzle games. <laughs> yes, the, the famous Ikaruga. <laughs> that's... I did, I, that, that was me call back to one of the <laughs> yeah, other videos, the, by the way. Ikaruga is not a puzzle game? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I know. I think the people who've seen that video tend to... It's not as popular as I was hoping it would be, but... Oh, man. Yeah. All these years... I cannot tell you. Every it's like a it's like contractually obligated whenever you review Ikaruga to mention it's a puzzle game and to talk about its puzzle elements and yeah. I don't want to go on the whole rant about that, but yeah, I think Ikaruga is an interesting one because it's a very particular style shmup. Like some some and it's not just like casual versus hardcore or anything like that. Like some really hardcore shmup players love Ikaruga. Like I know Plasmo definitely does, and a lot of really talented shmup players love it. And other ones don't like it as much, and I'm kind of in the middle. Like, I try really hard to get into it, but I just can't the same way as I could uh, Radiant Silver Gun, for example. So, 
someday, someday I think I'll try to play it and do a good job in it. But I just like it has a certain pace to it that for me is just hard to get into. It's a very slow paced shmup, <laughs> at least initially in the first few stages. The Dark Souls of shmups. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Sh- I, I actually was one of the reasons why I haven't picked it up is because intuitively it felt like it had to look it looked like it had to feel slower um, yeah yeah and just obviously there are puzzle elements to it I'm not gonna say it's a puzzle game but obviously there are some puzzle elements to it and um, it just didn't look like it it just didn't appeal to me well what's funny is like Ikaruga for I don't know if it's starting to finally sort of lose its sheen a little bit but for a really long time that was the shmup you know like if you ever said hey have you ever heard of shmup or ever played shmup they're like oh ikaruga ikaruga like it was just so synonymous with the genre and being like sort of the main title of the genre which is kind of interesting because it's so so unique of a game it is great though and it, it is made by treasure who make amazing games so it's not like it's not deserve, but it's just sort of an odd fit. I always thought that Ikaruga would be the shmup. It'd be kind of. I'm trying to think of like a good analogy to that. It'd be. What year did it come out? Oh, it came out on the Dreamcast in 2000. Oh, so it's older. Area somewhere. <laughs> yeah, okay. it's it's older, but in the in the world of shmups, it's not too old. The well, that's what that's shmup. kind of what I was thinking was like you know maybe if it came out like relatively recently, where there's not a lot of up like new shmup releases yeah, maybe yeah. it kind of got thrown in as the only shmup people know i don't know i think it was definitely in the right place at the right time that was definitely a part of its appeal it was in definitely the right place right time type of game because it came out on the dreamcast sort of and it um was 3d and it, it looks great and then it has the mechanics the polarity system like it had all the pieces that were needed to make it like kind of a, a cool pickup to people who don't really who aren't really into shmups, but they're more into niche style things, you know. So it was mm-hmm. really in the right place at the right time, I think. It would be interesting, like, to see if a game like that came out now, if it would catch on as much. I would, I would argue, probably not. Yeah, you gotta wonder. I mean, because so much now is, um, you know, review sites and professional reviewers people look to those those people to provide them with the insight because you know not everybody's just gonna throw their entire paycheck at, at games right so that they, is they, true that's a good point so you have to you know if you don't have reviewers that are going to either review them at all or review them highly i mean i know that if you look at the top reviews on the switch i mean crimson clover has really good reviews mm-hmm. um i th- think Dodonpachi Resurrection got really good critical reviews as well. So those things are reviewing well, but you know, without kind of newer things happening all the time and if those things don't get publicity, they just kind of get un- inter- um, reviewed under the table. Right. And people don't see them. Well, how are you going to The real a huge issue with shmups and like the reviewing history of shmups, it's kind of weird. It's because they've always sort of reviewed well like almost all shmups like almost all cave games not all of them but almost all of them have reviewed really well historically and everything and they get good scores but it's kind of always like when you go back and you read those reviews and i've yammered on this topic quite a bit but if you go back and read a lot of those reviews they're always sort of treated as sort of a novelty item you know it's like yeah we're giving the game a good review but it's just because we don't know what else to do with this thing you know it's not like like the the there's, I have like two big pet peeves with reviews with shmups. One of them is that they're they're sort of like an exercise for reviewers to show how smart and how many words they know. So if you go and read a lot of like, this is why I kind of made fun of that R-Type Final 2 review by Eurogamers. Like if you go and read a lot of shmup reviews, especially in the sort of 360 era, a lot of it is just sort of an excuse for the reviewers to show off their literary skills, the you know they go real they get real romantic with the language and they get really like they're just telling all this this big old story and everything but you actually learn almost nothing about the game like you right. you could read one and read the other get resurrection sdoj you know there's no difference ketsui what's the difference right there's like no real substance to the reviews as far as what makes this shmup particularly different from another shmup or what what's interesting about it 
but it will sort of romanticize the genre and say, well, you know, the ancient days of the Japanese arcade, you know, and they do that whole thing every time. Right. Yeah. So that's one pet peeve of mine where you don't really ever get to the actual substance of the review. And then another pet peeve of mine with uh, shmup reviews is that they're just sort of really just past. They don't really like uh, look for any particular things to criticize. So like, I, I actually feel like shmups sometimes review too well because sh some shmups just get away with murder and they still get like an eight out of 10. And then other shmups do everything. If the reviewer doesn't know the genre though. Right, yeah. Right? The other... like if the reviewer doesn't know the genre, they're just reviewing, like what are they doing, right? Yeah, exactly. And then other shmups like Ketsui Destiny, one of the greatest shmups ever, it did review well, but if every single shmup reviews well, how is that special? You know, wh right. what makes Ketsui Destiny special if, you know, Psycho Collection gets 8 out of 10 and it gets a 9 out of 10? Like, even though, in my opinion, the difference in quality between those ports is massive. Like, if you're if they're both 8s out of 10s or 9s out of 10s, it's almost meaningless. So I think that's been the real struggle with Shmup Reviews. It's just there's been no real um, way to tell them apart from one another they just blend they all merge and blend together in this big old uh, wash of words i think um it's interesting that you say that because puzzle games not not talking ikaruga here but <laughs> yeah. puzzle games we'll leave ikaruga and, out of this um one. yeah uh and um you know like visual not like walking simulators or oh, visual yeah, novel type yeah. games right like those also tend to review pretty well mm -hmm. oh yeah i bet but, probably also don't really do that well compared you know and it's not like the witcher 3 or whatever right right yeah exactly so. or it's like the opposite of dead or alive right dead or alive always gets slammed by the critics and always except six six didn't sell that well but normally dead or alive comes out gets slammed by the critics sells a bunch of copies and i i i'm a big defender of that series but or ninja gaiden like anything team ninja basically you know comes out critics <laughs> kind of smack talk it but it sells well and then, uh, yeah, then you have the opposite problem with shmups, puzzle games, visual novels, even like more hardcore RPGs, you know, so stuff outside of the main tentpole stuff, like all that stuff, you, reviewers will fawn over them, but they don't have that, uh, they don't get a wider audience, right? So right. that is an interesting, yeah, exactly. interesting aspect to it. Part of it, I think is probably marketing, but I think also part of it is sort of a, where the reviewers aren't necessarily trying to really communicate to the readers like what makes this visual novel good over another one right mm -hmm. or do they even have a system to communicate that exactly what do you think shmups could do um to make themselves more exciting to your typical gamer i mean it, you know it, people like you and i might be really interested in the gameplay and be fine with beating our heads against a wall for a while but right you know a lot of people probably aren't and so what is i mean do you put rogue roguelite elements in there or do you you know what do you what do you do well that's a great that's a great question because i think a number of these ideas have actually been tried out and played out and we can sort of look at how it turned out for example like Enter the Gungeon could be a good example of that, right? That's like a roguelike shmup type thing, right? And that thing did yeah. pretty well. So I would say, in a sense, that go on the roguelite route. Like, if you were, okay, like, take the broader con context of the genre away. If you were just a indie developer and you came to me and you said, Mark, I want to make money. I'm making a shmup-ish game, and I, but I need to make some money here. I need to get an audience here. Do I make... Mm -hmm. Crimson Clover 2 type game or do I make Enter the Gungeon type game? Too. I would say make the Enter the Gungeon game. That sales wise, marketing wise, reviewer wise, like whatever interest wise, that will probably be more successful. But as far as like the the genre itself, like I wouldn't really want to see it go the roguelite direction because it is a pretty massive change to how the genre works if you start introducing too much roguelike elements into it and then with how purist do you think it needs to stay oh that's a good question i think um everything you can get away with under the hood that you can keep the same i think would be really strong so like like the, the weird thing is is that this is actually 
there's even like small changes that could be kind of hard to pin down. For example, one trend that we're seeing with beat em ups that seems to be working commercially is extending the length of the game. So beat em ups went from 40 minutes to now two hours. Fight and Rage, mm -hmm. uh, unless you're hustling through that on turbo speed mode like I am, that's like a two hour game. A Streets of Rage 4, that's like a two hour game. I could see that easily happening with shmups, right? They take a shmup. Now, instead of being 40 minutes, it's two hours or whatever. And then, you get easier really, then you really stretch out that difficulty curve, right? So it's like, instead of being like that ramp, it's like this slow incline <laughs> in difficulty. Right. Uh, I mean, that's one obvious change that could work for you commercially and everything. And reviewers would love it because they're like, oh, my God, it's a shmup that's two hours long. We've been waiting for this forever. Uh, right. How many times do you see that? I was like, well, there could be more stages. <laughs> Actually, quite a bit. You I see know. That exactly. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. You see that in a lot of not just that Ikaruga one, which I cannot help but make fun of. But also, you'll see that like there's been Raiden ones where they've talked about that. I think a Raiden mm -hmm. four reviews, you know, they're like, well, it's a cool game and everything, but it's only half hour. You know, it should be an hour at least. Like modern reviewers are really into game length. That's like a big thing with modern reviewers. So that's like an easy sort of out you could take is just make it twice as long or whatever. But like personally, I wouldn't want to see that happening because I think it does really, really shift your experience of the game. So there's maybe some compromises there where you could like I wish Streets of Rage I wish Streets of Rage 4 would do this where they have like the story mode that's all two hours. Then they have like a cut down arcade mode where they literally just throw out half the stages and just give you the good stages. And that's like an hour long. So you could just play arcade mode for an hour instead of playing story mode for two hours. That could be an idea. Um, that might be hell on earth for the developer, but you could you could do that. <laughs> Do you think it's because people on average are playing more games now for longer? So they want longer games? I, I think it's just the... I wonder what you think about this too. I think it's just the way game design has shifted and sort of... Uh, even the way we talk about game design over the years has really shifted to... Like we want bloated releases. We want releases that are ever expanding, ever growing, constantly new but really not that new right like mm -hmm. uh you see this in a lot of stuff not even just mainstream yeah. games where like oh there's a new neo there's a new dlc there's a new quest there's a new dlc of the dlc there's a new like you see that all the time like constantly adding dlc stages more stuff but even in like fighting games where they're constantly okay here's a new dlc Add with character. characters here's a new dlc with characters you know, by the time the game's over, the roster's like 68 people or something. Think of Smash, right? How big is the roster of Smash now? It just keeps growing and growing and growing. It's mm -hmm. insane. I think that. Yeah, I, I think you'll see that across all the genres, not just uh, not just the mainstream one. No, I completely agree. And I, I, I think it's because people are gaming longer. Like they're spending more of their time playing games. I think that's true. And, and so they want, and, and right, like they start investing all of this time into something. And so they, it's, and this is particularly like with something like fighting games, right? Uh, when you spend a thousand hours learning all of your combos or whatever on this one character, and now they're just going to drop support for this and go to the next game and people lose their minds, right? Like I put thousands of hours in this and I, uh -huh. now I'm not going to be any good. I'm going to have to go to the next. Yeah. So <laughs> been there many times myself. <laughs> Yeah, so I think that there's a lot of resistance. Well, and people just generally are resistant to change. So, well, the fighting games especially have them. They've put themselves in a pickle. I think it's it's like a double edged sword with this because the idea Tekken does this. Uh, the idea is okay. In order to keep the game relevant, we need to do something with it every so months. Otherwise, because the way the fighting games and just gaming is now is there, there's so many releases coming out. This is this is a real problem with 2D games too, where I go to my locals, they are playing a different game every time I go. It's absurd. I'll go there one month and like, okay, what are we playing? Strive. Okay. So I go, I get Strive, I learn Strive, I come back next week, next you know, month or so. Okay, what are we playing now? I thought we we're playing Strive. Eh, you know, Undernight came out. So now we're all playing Undernight. All right, let me go get Undernight. I go practice Undernight, come back. All right, I'm ready to play Undernight. 
Yeah, but Blaze Blue got rollback netcode, so we're playing Blaze Blue now. <laughs> this is literally, this isn't hypothetical. This is literally happening to me. Every time I go to locals, they are playing a new game. So I, I came next time and I said, you know what? I am playing Tekken. I don't care what any of you guys are doing. I cannot do this anymore. So I'm going to show up every week and play Tekken. Who's, who's going to stick with Tekken or not? You know, that's just, I had to put my foot down. But like, it is insane. And so I think this is what a lot of fighting games are struggling with. And a lot of like arcade, like all genres of games are struggling with right now is they need to stay relevant or try to stay relevant. So they constantly add new content. So Tekken's on season four now. They're always patching it. They're always adding new characters. They're, you know, Devil Jin's Hell Sweep knocks down one month. The next month it's nerfed. It doesn't knock down. Then the third month it knocks down, but the range shortened. And then the next month it tracks way better. All of a sudden is electrics work on both sides for a bit. Then they nerf that. It's like a, a constant roller coaster of uh, experience. Like the World of Warcraft yeah, I know. syndrome or whatever, right? Like yeah. where they just constantly incrementally change things. And, you know, and and that's something you can't do with shmups. Exactly. You can't just <laughs> add more content. Like it is what it is because otherwise now you can't compete for scoring. Yeah. Otherwise, you yeah. explode the scoring history. Imagine that. Imagine you get a world record. The next month, your world record is void because they add in another stage. Like, all right, now I gotta, now I gotta learn the game again with a new stage in there. And then the next mm -hmm. month, they're like, well, we felt like the milk on the stage three boss was a little excessive, so we nerfed the milk on the stage three boss. So your record's like unbeatable now because all the milking in stage three was removed. Like, yeah, you cannot yeah. do that with a shmup because it would no. destroy the competitive integrity of them. So that is a re that is like a refreshing part of the genre for me, at least. Like, it is cool that in something like Dota Pachi, I have this VHS of it. Maybe I'll edit edit a picture of it in here. Uh, I have a VHS tape of Dota Pachi of a guy playing it in like 2000 and getting a 600 million score on a VHS in 2000. What's funny is that score is still competitive today, not world record wise, but for for me, like I can't beat that score, you know, 600 right. million. And so like I could literally compete with some someone from like 15 years ago today, you know, and it's the same game. The scores are still equivalent. There's no, you know what? That's that's crazy. That's that's something that's super cool in shmups. That's so rare in other genres that you don't really get. Yeah. Across. And it's also really nice for people who you know, maybe they want a game, they want to get a little bit of that competitive uh, edge out, right? But they don't have time to go to a local game group yes. and play, or maybe they don't want fighting games. Maybe they can't go to the arcade. Maybe they can't do this or that. Yeah, exactly. Um, they can't join an online thing. You can still compete, right? Like you, you can just, and, and you're sort of competing against yourself. Like how good can I be today mm -hmm. versus how good can I be tomorrow? Exactly. And it gives you, it gives you a sense of accomplishment without, you know, making you want to rage quit or right, right, or without that roller coaster of uh, like I've run into this. I love fighting games. I'll continue to play them, but I mean they are a roller coaster competitive wise. Mm -hmm. Where I got pretty good at Street Fighter Four, and then Five came out, and that was that. And I didn't like Five, so it's like, okay, what do I do with this skill set? It just melts away, right? Or Another problem is like I feel like I'm pretty good at some fighting games, but there there's so few people who play them or care about them that it's almost meaningless. Like I'm pretty good at Dead or Alive, but there's a, there's not many Dead or Alive players out there. So mm -hmm. like recently I've decided, okay, as much as I love Dead or Alive, I'm still gonna play it and play a little bit online here and there. But I'm gonna focus more of my energy in Tekken because it's just such a bigger scene and it is more widely recognized and respected. So. Like you run into that sort of issue a lot with fighting games that you don't really run into a shmups necessarily. You can a little bit like if there's only it's only you playing this one obscure shmup, it can feel that way. But like with Don Pachi or whatever, you know, there's just there's just a it's more, much more stable, right? Like you're you're not worried about three years from now. Are all the scores of Don Pachi going to be removed? And plus, the world record is so high. You could spend 20 years just chasing the world record now. Like you don't even need any more scores to compete with because that those skills ceiling is already so high that if you could even scrape at it, that would be impressive. So, right. 
Yeah, like th that type of thing you don't really need to worry about with shmups as much. I think that is a bit of a barrier for entry, though, for people like like myself who are newer to the genre. Yeah. Like if, if you were going to do some sort of event, like and you have Shmup Slam mm -hmm. and to compete in something like that, right, is really intimidating because you know that you're like if you're going to play against this niche group of people who have been playing Shmups for who, who knows how long. Decades. And... <laughs> They're just getting these massive scores, and you don't even know where the points are coming from. You're like, what is yeah. it? What is even happening here? So, there's always going to be that barrier to entry where people are like, eh, do I do I want to go and even do this and embarrass myself in front of like people? You know, whatever. Yeah, that, that I think that's the biggest competitive wise. That's the biggest weakness of shmups right now that we need to sort of figure something out for. That's kind of one of the main reasons I put slam together was because, like. The top end side of things is really compelling, right? Like, there's a lot in the top end. Like, if you if you come into shmups and you're like Moglar and you're chasing world records and right. there's a lot for you to do. There's a lot of people who will, well, relatively speaking, there's a lot of people who will be interested in what you're up to. Like, it has a lot of built-in meaning, right? But that's a very small slice of the shmupping population who are able to do that. And so... There's this sort of listlessness for newer players or like mid-range players, myself included, where I'm not ever going to break the Donompachi world record or anything. So you need to find some sort of way to make your your gaming purpose feel relevant and matter a bit. But it's it's not realistic to expect everyone to be setting world records and everything. So that's why I thought like having an event like Shmup Slam, where it's more of just a demonstration across many skill levels. You don't need to be a world record holder or anything to, to get into Shmup Slam. Like having that, I think that's a, a really good way to go about it is having a, a venue or an opportunity to show off your gameplay. Because even if you're not great, Shmups are fun to watch live because, you know, you could die any second. And it is that the human drama element of the game itself is still pretty interesting, even if they're not world record players or anything i think that's a that's a, well first of all i think that's a really good point i think it's cool that you are setting up an event like that um i think this gets back to that thing though that the, the competition on the one hand right it's it's positive that you can compete with somebody from 15 years ago on the negative side you're competing with someone from 15 years ago yeah so <laughs> if you if, right if you go and play a fighting game right there's that one guy right there Exactly. All you have to do is beat that one guy, and you've done something for yourself. You've beat that one guy. Yes. But you go play a shmup, and you're never going to beat this, and you're just not... There's no way to get around that fact. Yeah, I know. And this has been a real... This is, like... There's a lot of, like, unanswered questions for the genre that it, it could be answered, but what the solution is is a little bit vague, right? This is another one of those. As far as, you know, what... What could you do with shmups to make them more immediately interesting competitive competitive wise? And there's like, you know, leaderboards. There's that idea. Like built in leaderboards in games. I think that helps a lot. But mm -hmm. again, it does. It, but it's I think that's one really good solution people should do. But it's still like, yeah, it would be cool to have some sort of that's why I tried the Kumite event where you remove the scoring and just had like survival duels. Because Toho seems to be somewhat successful in this because most of Toho, a lot of like Toho World Cup and everything, a lot of it is like survival duels. And that's a little bit more translatable, I think, to like competition than scoring duels. Because unless you're SPS and Foo 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 and you have like incredibly similar scoring routes, it's like impossible to pair players up scoring wise. Like Jammers and I both played on Ampachi, we both got into alls, but our scoring potential is so drastically different that unless Jammers' hand explodes or something, like there's no way I'm beating his score. <laughs> so <laughs> but but it like in a survival duel, it would be a little bit more doable that I could now I'm not saying that I could, because I didn't, but like it is conceivable that I could potentially get closer to beating him in a survival duel, because all he would need to do is not to all and I two to all, and then I could beat him. So that was one idea I've, I've had, and I might do next after Shmup Slam Five. I'm gonna do another Kumite to test this a little more, see if it catches on a bit. But like survival duels could be an answer. Yeah, that seems like a neat idea. And then of course there's uh, there is uh, PVP shmups like Rival uh, Rival Mega Gun that 
seems to be catching on a bit. Like, that is a real thing. Like, a, a core gamer Treff, uh, that there's this German... I've never uh, heard of it. Well, it's this German um, venue, and they host in-person uh, duels in a rival a rival Mega Gun that seemed to be pretty popular, or popular-ish for Shmup. So that's another idea. See, I've never even heard of rival Mega Gun. Yeah, well, it's it's a newer shmup. Um, it is on the Switch, but I think the Switch version isn't that great because of the input lag. The Steam mm. version is the way you want to go. But that could be another you know avenue. Is like have actual direct PvP shmupping. That's something that's been a little bit explored. Interesting. I'm trying to like think of what this would look like, and I can just keep envisioning like. Oh well, Pong yeah. With bullet. <laughs> it, basically, the way it works, uh, just basically, is that. You're side by side, sort of like, you know, competitive Tetris, you know, how like you're side by side in Tetris, okay. but you're not like throwing mm -hmm. Tetris blocks at each other directly. So you're side by side and then the stage thing spawns enemies and you like chain them and combo them. And the way you chain and combo them gets you meter or whatever. And then that you shoot over at your enemy. And there is a, there is a, a mode or a ability in Rival May Gun where you actually do take control of a ship for a minute or two and you fly this little boss ship and you fly it around their screen and it it's like nerfed so you can't just totally destroy them but uh so i think rival mega is probably the most the closest i've seen to like it's either that or twinkle star sprites as like a really good pvp shmup but there i have also seen like arena pvp shmups where they're like you literally are like flying around trying to shoot each other and stuff <laughs> I don't think those work quite as well, but who knows? Maybe there'd be a... Because the problem with those is if you start to add on to those too much, you, you just start shifting into like a third person shooter or you'd start shifting into like a virtual on or something, right? So I, I feel like those aren't as interesting as like the side by side Tetris style one. Yeah, because then is it really a shmup anymore in the sense of... Because we were talking about like how pure does the genre need to stay, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, because once you get like to that sort of battle arena thing, why not just play a first-person shooter at that point right. or something, right? Uh, I mean, there is a kind of there could be a nice middle ground there that I'm not seeing, but at this point, I think uh, the side-by-side -side ones I think work a little better. So now that you're, I, I wanted to get a little bit more into sort of um, your your viewpoint on the genre, though, uh, the fresh perspective. So. Right now, what when you look at a shmup you want to pick up, what are you personally looking for? Like, what stands out to you is like this is either a buy or not buy for a shmup. I mean, outside of <laughs> like you know, watching you review it. Um, I mean, is that a factor? Like, if you like, like yeah, you're going along the shop and you're like, oh, what does what do what do uh, shmup YouTubers think of this? Is that, yeah. is that a factor? Yeah, absolutely. Because that's crazy. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think you sort of said this already, or at least alluded to it. The quality of shmups is really like, you know, you can either be way over here or you might be way over here, right? I was yeah. The screen. And if I haven't played it and maybe you have, then you can say like, okay, this shmup is really not. Right. That's very, very true, interesting. Yeah. And it's not like i mean you have cave right which historically has all these great shmups which you know most of them are going to be yeah. really really good if not all of them yes but it's not like you know you had said treasure right as a great developer it's not like you can look at developer names and just go and usually and go oh this is going to be great because right. it's made by <laughs> yeah like so, right in five versus right in four right that's a good a good one right so really i mean how is a person to know unless you just want a shotgun approach and buy everything and then just test it out yourself yeah that is true yeah so, yeah yeah that's something i've i've uh i mean i get it's interesting because it's like i get that my reviews could be helpful to people but i do often forget that like new players might be getting a lot of information from my reviews whereas i always feel like you guys kind of already know this stuff, but it's good that I say it out loud type of thing. <laughs> but I do forget that a lot of people could genuinely have no idea until they watch my video. Yeah. And, and you know, for the most part, I don't. So I, I now know, right, 
cave and I know some other things. And I sort of know what I'm looking for. Um, I really I enjoy bullet hell stuff, but there's not that much out there, really. If, I mean, you mentioned Rolling Gunner, which I haven't picked up yet. Um, but other than that, like most of the things that are available on the Switch, I have. So it's just about playing those things and trying to get better at them. But, and I think this gets kind of to the overarching whole point of this thing, which is how do we get new shmups in development that are good and that mm, people want to yeah. play and that are attractive to people because there's only so long where you can keep playing the game where you have to compete with this guy from 15 years ago, right? Like, are, are people just going to continue playing cave games for the next 50 years or whatever? Like, if, yeah, if well, something doesn't come out, Dep- depending on who you ask, I uh, that. I actually don't know the answer to that. So, for example, if you asked Plasma that, he would say yes. <laughs> he would say, we don't need... He's even said, like, we don't need new shmups. Forget that. We have plenty of shmups as it is, and we all don't play them enough as it is. We could literally play the, the library of shmups we have now forever, and we still would never get through them all because of how deep the genre is and how many titles there are out there. But for me, I, I kind of see where you come from, too. It's like, well... You do want to see the genre progress further in some way, right? Like it is like it is an interesting genre because it is so ahead of many other genres in so many ways as far as the game design, the difficulty, the quality. Like you're not going to run out of quality shmups anytime soon. But at the same time, they do sort of just stop, right? There's just an end point to the more bigger studios making shmups and then from there we have indies sort of carrying us from that point but it would be cool to see the genre pushed forward in like a huge way right and my my and also to get new people right exactly and to get people more interested in the genre just mm-hmm. generally my dream sh- shmup for this would be like best case scenario dream this won't happen but best case scenario would be is you get cave right and they decide, you know what, let's make Mushihima-sama 3. And, but they get on board some graphical designers from Arc Systems who made like Dragon Ball Fighters or whatever. And they I... make Mushihima-sama with Dragon Ball, uh, like that quality, the Arc System quality graphics. And they make those two come together. That would be my dream shmup right there. Just keep that brilliant, beautiful gameplay but put on top of it just mind-blowing graphics. And I've I always felt like this seems sort of like, you know, it's not that exciting of an idea because it's so obvious, but it also seems like, why don't we do this? This seems like the most obvious solution is just blow people's minds with insane graphics because... And Arc System Works, you're right, is really good. Like, yeah, Dragon Ball Fighters on, on the Switch, and then also um, they have... Uh, Blaze Blue, yeah, right. I think Arc System well, does Blaze Blue as well. Yeah, and Guilt. I think the big and Guilty one Gear, was Guilty Gear, uh, Exer. Mm. When they came up with this whole, I think that game was a game changer as far as uh, visuals, two D visual, three D, two D visuals. Because what what it is is Guilty Gear Exer that came out on the PS3, which is crazy. Is it's actually a three D game and it uses three D lighting and three D modeling and stuff. But they found a technique to make these 3D models and everything have this really stylized, awesome 2D look. If we put that on a shmup, I think that could be insane. Like that quality of lighting and graphics and particle effects and just, but like in a really good shmup, I think that could be a game changer. That would be my my proposal is for a game changing shmup. I think that's an awesome idea. That sounds so cool, actually. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I love that idea. Because they did it with fighting games. They did it with 2D fighting games. And now Arc System Works are like killing it right now. They are absolutely oh, yeah. killing it right now. So yeah, I, their I stuff feel looks like, beautiful. And it runs beautiful. Yeah, I feel like that could be a great... Like it works here. I think it could work in shmups too. Because rather than trying to... Because I think honestly trying to shift the genre mechanically... I don't think is as going to be as effective as shifting the genre visually. I as far as sales, getting people into it, um, because I think 
I don't think the mechanics of the genre are actually the huge turning off point. I mean, there are things you could tweak a bit, like you're saying, like having some kind of modes where you know, you're not absolutely destroyed in stage one <laughs> and stuff like that could really go a long way. Like renaming it so you're not calling it super dumb baby mode. <laughs> like all those things could really help out a lot. But I think just that some smart decisions with the continue system, with the difficulty system, with the training modes, and then really pushing those graphics. That would be my proposal anyway. What do you think? I think, yeah, no, no, no. I think the graphics idea is a fantastic idea. And also I think it would be awesome to see. But I also think um, if there was a way to, which of course there is, but it has to be done. Um, so you have arcade mode, right? Which mm -hmm. is is just, you know, you do the stages. I could also envision a game that had not only arcade mode, but almost like a story mode where it had RPG elements. So you progress through stages and, and a story or whatever, mm -hmm. and you were able to out maybe allocate points or something to change your shot, change your ship, change whatever. And then in the arcade mode, right, everything's standardized. You have to use this shot, you have to use this yeah, ship or whatever. Yeah. But so that it's competitive for scoring, but then you have that story mode that allows you to customize things and kind of have another experience, but still similar. I think that I think that seems like a really good idea. And I think people have taken shots at it. But I think uh, the tricky parts, like I'm, I'm thinking that is a good idea, but there are certain elements of that that I think you got to watch out for. Otherwise, you could get yourself into like Euro shmup territory a little too much. For, for, for example, um, like there's different things you could do to prevent this. But one thing that I always worry about with that type of approach is like the drawing out. So if you draw out that gameplay loop, you draw that out and really extend it, it mm -hmm. kind of doles it down to where it might be a bit boring in the beginning stages. Like let's say you start off the RPG mode and it's like, You've just got this little baby standard shot and you're just sort of floating along, shooting a few enemies here and there. It, it, it could easily be like, well, this game's a little boring, right? So hmm. I, I feel like... Yeah, it would have to be well done. Yeah, I f I'm trying to feel... I feel like that is a great idea, but I'm trying to think how you could pull that off without falling into that trap of like floating along, it's boring. But it must be possible, right? Because RPGs do it. Yeah, they definitely do. But then, like you said, you quit them in a couple hours. I do, hours, I know. So I, know. I quit them three hours in. So, <laughs> yeah, it is, a, it is a good question. How do you how do you get, get that working? I, I, honestly, I think what it does is it targets multiple audiences. Because right. you have yeah. the audience that will do that, but then you also have the more hardcore shmup audience that would play the arcade mode more. Yeah, maybe that, that like you say, maybe have a, that both options in the game that way you're not tied into one or the other too much i do like the idea and i do know a lot of people have thought about it a lot as far as like adding in an rpg style system into a shmup i think the closest i've found is radiant silver gun has a mode like that it has story mode and has arcade mode and arcade mode is like an hour and story mode i heard is like two and a half hours <laughs> so that that would be a good shmup to uh, examine but the problem that I is, haven't played either. Yeah, but the problem is with Radiant Silver Gun is that that didn't seem to be the uh, the money maker, right? It was actually Ikaruga who came along and did much better uh, success wise than Silver Gun did. But maybe hmm. maybe nowadays that would work a little better than in the Dreamcast or Saturn days. I guess I came out on the Saturn. Right now we have that. We need that longer gaming yes, experience. Yeah. Right. I feel like there's. There's, there's like an obvious solution to it that's just evading me somehow as far as like getting people to get... Well, you play a lot of RPGs. You probably have more insight into this than I do. Like when you're playing an RPG, like what keeps you going? What keeps you in invested? I mean, in recent years, I've had a hard time. I'm the same as you. I, right, I can't right. finish them anymore. I, play, you know, I, I played a lot of RPGs when I was a kid. Um, and it was the... It was the character customization, right? It was the right. build, building power and trying to optimize your character. I mean, right, there's there's the um, Magic the Gathering, I believe, has those archetypes, right? There's like the Timmy and the Spike 
and the, what was the other one? Johnny, I think. I'm not sure. So the Magic the Gathering, you, you were familiar with Magic the Gathering, yes, right? Yes. The card game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the developers came up with a a naming convention for their players. Jimmy, or Timmy, Johnny, and Spike, I think is what they were. And they each had a, and it was like, okay, we know that there are these three types of players out there. And this is why they play Magic the Gathering. Oh, okay. Well, I want to hear. The, what are the three types? Well, I think it's like the Timmy is like, I just want to play big creatures and smash my opponent. And I don't <laughs> care if I lose. It doesn't, you know what I mean? Yeah. The Johnny, I think, was like, I want to like play these cool cards and get some interesting effects happening. And I, again, I don't care so much if I win. I just want my deck to come together, right? Okay. So he's and like the, the deck spike, builder guy. He's all, he's into right. that. I, I think I know these types of people. Now that you're sort of getting it, getting it through to me. Like yeah. the, that guy, he's the guy who sits down and explains to you, well, if you have this card and you pair it with this card, then the status effect doubles here. And then you could swap over exactly. to this card. Okay. I get that. Yeah. Okay. What's the third and then type the then? spike. The spike is the like tournament player. Like I'm going to optimize. I'm going to play whatever is optimal, whatever's the best, and I have to win at all costs. Like I taquito. don't care. <laughs> He's the taquito, right? So, so you know, if you think of players in that way, Where which I'm sure yourself? that this carries over, right, to video games to some degree. Now the archetypes might be different, but Where would you I'm put sure that you could target. Three? Where do I fit? Yeah, which are you of the three? Mm, probably spike yeah me too unfortunately absolutely i'm like 100 percent spike yeah i always play like top tier ish characters and like optimize and yeah i'm the type of guy that's like well like this combo may not be on paper the optimal combo but if you hit it nine out of ten times in pressure situations it's the better combo even though the other combo yeah if you hit this two frame jab you can float them and then hit them to the wall technically you know what i mean like yeah yeah, yeah i'm a very spike type person for sure yeah timmy's, though, timmy's the guy is timmy the guy who does like three uppercuts and you block all three and he's like i'm going for that fourth uppercut i don't right. care what <laughs> happens <laughs> i'm gonna do the fourth uppercut exactly yeah yeah yeah, so I no, I'm I try to get away from it, right? Like I try to go, no, okay, I don't need to always be optimizing everything. Like I yeah. need to just like, you know and it never works. I always go back to optimizing. You know what's funny is I think the majority of shmup players would actually fall in the ones I know would actually fall into the Jimmy category where they're really into like the technical side of the scoring system. Oh, if you do this here and do there. And then like all about optimizing the games and those types of players, I think do really well in shmups. Um, I'm a much more like the spike type of person where it's like, well, this may lose me points in stage three, but it's more consistent so that I can actually continue on to stage four here. So it is interesting. Yeah, you could even apply these to shmup. Yeah. So I think you'd have to find, you know, you'd have to obviously do more uh, bigger company or something, get some market research going <laughs> yeah, or somebody yeah. with more intuition than me. But yeah. You know, figure out these various types of players, how to target them, and then what you would need in a game to kind of bring all these people in, or right. at least hit two of the three audiences or something. Yeah. Well, what does Timmy want? That's the big question. We know what Jimmy wants. We know Timmy what Spike wants. Those wants. big explosions. <laughs> he does... wants all those medals I think that's, falling. I think that's the missing piece. I think we got the spikes and the Jimmys. We need the Timmys in there. I think that's the missing piece of Shmup. Is how do you get? I honestly them think that's involved. the biggest subgroup. That's the biggest subgroup of people. Yeah. How do you get them to feel like they're doing three dragon punches? You know, how do you imp- put that into a shmup? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, this is why games like, um, you know, Uncharted and uh, like these types of games sell so well, because it's not like people are really doing anything. Like if I think of playing a game like that, right? Mm-hmm. I realize that there's no way to differentiate my play versus anybody else. Exactly. Exactly. Um, there's nothing that I can do to customize what i'm doing make myself better what it's just kind of like it's like i'm Dynasty just going Warriors. through <laughs> it's like i've done the motions yeah and but but i think that there's a huge number of people out there that that's what they want to do they want to see the big explosions they want to see the character do some insane you know like whatever jean-claude van damme action thing that, yeah 
nobody could really do in real life, but whatever, they, they saw it happen there on screen and they felt like they were doing it and all they had to do was press the button for the quick time event. Yeah, that's a good point. Some Something like that. Yeah. I think uh, actually DFK does a kind of a good job of this and Crimson Clover does a good job of this a bit. Where with the novice modes, I think they could do a better job with this though, is in the novice modes, rather than doing the super easy strategy, which I think is a bad idea, where you just cut down the stage and like remove enemies and remove bullets. Instead, what you could do is you could like secretly buff the shit out of the player, but the player doesn't fully understand how buff they are. Like you mm. could you could underneath the hood make that hitbox like the size of a pep like one pixel. So they're just like right. melting through bullet patterns. Um or even okay, this could be really good. Even add in some like sub sub uh like some really uh tricky ai where like the bullets they they give you a little bit of give but without oh, you like really they actually fully come noticing. away from you yeah, right? like right they'll they part close. just ever so slightly just ever so slightly before they hit you give you that little bit of extra dodging room and stuff that could now that could be an interesting idea where it, it's totally like could. yeah where it's like not fully obvious that the game's be taking it easy on you but it is like it's making your hitbox smaller it's making the bullet hitboxes smaller it's giving you a lot of auto bombs that like recharge and stuff mm -hmm. and then like the bullets sort of bend out of your way just a little bit so if you're playing badly they'll still hit you but if you're like tr really trying it gives you that little bit of leeway or even do something like as the bullets come close to you they slow down just a tad like just a tad as they near you so you get that little extra time to dodge them. All that could be pretty interesting. Like that could all be really interesting in a in a novice mode. And of course, you don't name it novice mm -hmm. mode. You name it regular mode, right? Right. Yeah. Exactly. I think that's all I good think ideas. Crimson Clover had right. Like after you played a certain amount of time, they give you type the Type Z ship. Yeah. Which is has like the benefits of like quick it's movement best ship ever, yeah. and <laughs> yeah. also like the huge spread. So, you know, you could you could even offer other options like that, like more powerful. Yeah, more powerful uh, ships and stuff. I mean, there are tons of people too that don't even care. Like they'll they'll just go, I'm taking this giant powerful ship. <laughs> yeah. just do and they don't even care, you know what I mean? Like they'll yeah, just me, do it every time. <laughs> just to see the explosions. Yeah, I think that. Or like give a ship with like fully piercing shots so it like pierces through everything. All right. Uh, there could be a lot of fun ideas there. I think that is a good direction to go rather than uh for the timmies rather than trying to wipe the screen and so everyone's sitting there like okay this is obviously easy and you're kind of kind of belittling me a little bit right yeah so, and i mean you could even get like you take the crimson clover example you could give somebody like unlimited hyper you know just like hyper oh, turn it on yeah. and off when you want there there's a there's a mode like that in xbox 360 and i will admit it's a bit of a guilty pleasure of mine. It's in the Dodonpachi black label port. It's type X mode. You just have hyper all the time. <laughs> it's <laughs> crazy. It is pretty fun. It's not very well made. It's not very well balanced. But I think the underlying idea is kind of fun. Like just mm -hmm. give the player hyper all the time. And let's see how this rolls. Speaking of uh, Dodonpachi, um, the Dodonpachi Resurrection black label arrange which is oh, a long yeah. name to say. Ketsupachi. It's like a Ketsui style. <laughs> is so amazing. Yeah, and I it makes me want to play actual Ketsui. Yeah, that's a great range, yeah. No, yeah. Th those That's another thing that's really cool. Awesome. Is those those big like pen that the big box, you know, that drops yeah. down like <laughs> ten you chips. See all those things. Yeah. Yeah, it's another like like you were saying earlier the the little dopamine hit or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Like it's the little reward system. Yeah, you see those big tens flying at you as you yes. keep the chain going. You're just like, ooh. Another interesting idea for a shmup that I think if this was the 90s, someone have, would have gone this direction already. But these days, this isn't a, as obvious as a direction was maybe make a shmup that's a little bit more violent, right? Like has like Mortal Kombat style blood splatters and stuff like Ninja Gaiden 2 or whatever. Like it's actually surprising that there really aren't many shmups like that. Gwange is a little bit like that, but that could also be an interesting direction, at least to get people to turn their heads. 
you know, like mm-hmm. a Doom style shmup where you like blow right. the shit out of demons and stuff. <laughs> like, why hasn't that been made? I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of good ideas here. Yeah, I know. Someone, someone, get on it. <laughs> there was a uh, let's see. This was maybe way back on PlayStation. There was a Mortal Kombat, and I don't even remember which one it was now. That had like a Tetris mode. And right. you played Tetris against your friend with Mortal Kombat, and then like you, you clear some lines, and your person would like, you, you know, your character would just like, you know, do some special move to the other character or whatever sitting over there. And you weren't really fighting Mortal Kombat; you were playing Tetris, but you were doing this sort of gratuitous violence on top <laughs> of the Tetris, which I think <laughs> is kind of what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Well, awesome. Any other topics you want to cover before we close out the episode? Did I miss? I feel like I might have missed one of like an important topic. So let me know if I did. I don't know. I think we I mean, I feel like our conversation was pretty good. I think pretty fluid. We covered a lot of ground. I don't know if there's anything that you can think of. Let me know. And Well, okay. I have one last uh, question for you. When you're looking right now, when you're looking at a shmup, what are the biggest turnoffs that you see in shmups? They're like, "Eh, I don't know if I want this or I don't know if I'd be interested in this. Um, well, the first biggest turnoff for me is, um, non-verticality. Ah, those hoary shmups. Yeah. And Death Smiles is, is quite good. And I agree with your, uh, at least from what I've played, I agree with your assessment that that's the best horizontal shmup. Definitely my Um, favorite. Another real contender is Rolling Gunner, though, I will say. That one's pretty good. All right, you sold me. Yeah, I'll... so you, you'll you'll I'll, be I'll playing do... it. You'll be like, why did Mark make me get this game? Right, this but is it is a good. novice. <laughs> yeah, play. Make sure to play novice mode because that is genuinely a very hard shmup. I'll give it a try. I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh. Oh, I guess Darius Darius Gaiden was pretty. Oh, I love He's Darius Gaiden. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, I, I share um... I share your uh, preference for vertical very much. Yeah, it's hard to get me yeah. to play a horizontal shmup too. So vertical definitely is is what I you know what I'd want to see. So horizontal is a bit of a turnoff. And then, um, you know, I I really have to say I like the bullet hell style. So if even if I if I was looking at stuff right now and you showed me Don Maku, right, um, Dan three versus I don't know. Um, Tiger Heli, maybe? <laughs> sure. Because I recently reviewed that. Um, I would probably pick Don Maku, right? Because there's more more stuff going on. Though I can see the other, you know, the appeal of the other. Yeah. For me, when it, when it right now, what, what really helps me with the older style shmups, like the non-Bullet Hell ones, are the ones with, like, fast movement speed. That I feel mm. like those really feel good. So, like, right in... time to react. Yeah, it gives you time to react, and it just feels a little bit more kinetic, right, than, like, yeah. the really slow movement speed, old-school shmup. So stuff like, for example, uh, Musha, where you can, like, turn up that movement speed really high, or... Uh, oh, another one that just occurred to me, and then I lost it. Uh, which one? Oh, Raiden, of course. Raiden Fighters Aces, for example, where you can play the slave ships and stuff, and they are so fast. Like, the movement speed in those games are crazy. Psycho, sort of same way, too. Psycho is interesting because it's kind of a bullet hell and kind of not. It's an interest. It's like its own thing. I I was playing um, Gunbird, too. Oh, that's my favorite Psycho, actually. Yeah, that that one's um is interesting. Well, it's ruthless. It takes some- it's a ruthless yes. game. <laughs> Especially yeah. when you get to like stage five, those bullet patterns are ruthless. If there's a stage five? Yeah, there is, yeah. <laughs> I think there's six of them. <laughs> and then you, there's actually a second loop too. So once you get through the first loop, then you're in for a real treat in the second loop. You should, um, at, one, you, at one of these stages, you should just watch a, a Gunbird 2 to all. Uh, those are wild. That's a, that's a thing that I... Um, don't do nearly as much as I could is is watch gameplay videos. Oh yeah, that was actually a question I wanted to ask you. Is is that okay? This is okay. You have to be honest with me because I want honest mm-hmm. data here. Mm-hmm. I feel like like pure gameplay stuff is actually really hard to sell to newer players or people who aren't super super into the genre. 
like how often do regular fans of the genre like pull up a 500 mil replay and just watch it like does game does pure gameplay appeal to you all that much or not really it definitely does but after i've won cc so and, and i'm like this with any type of game that i that i have played historically i don't like to look up information until i've experienced the thing myself and dealt with it myself because i want to see if i can come up with solutions now if i get really stuck maybe but I want to see if I come up with solutions. Now, not everybody's probably like that. Um, yeah, there's probably a lot of people that... <laughs> I look totally it up going... immediately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. But but once, I, once I've done it and I feel like, okay, I've accomplished this thing, then I'm definitely, yeah, like I'll watch gameplay videos of, you know, watch somebody get 800 million in Katsui or something. I don't know, whatever. But yeah, yeah it's interesting. I think that's, that is a... So I've always wondered, like, for instance, I do these commentary clear videos on my channel and stuff. And I always wondered, like, I, they get like okayish views and everything, but I always wondered, like, I enjoy doing them, so I'll probably continue doing the them. The commentary clears are really cool. Yeah, I always I like wondered, those. like, do those have an untapped potential or is that just a, just sort of an average type of video that people like? I, I can't decide. I, I think it's because it's it's so nice because when you are able to give little tips here and there for people you're like oh okay so you see right here is where you need to go in sort of like a u pattern because right. you're trying to get the book then i think it really helps people who you know maybe haven't figured that sort of thing out yet and that makes them feel like they're kind of organically learning as you play yourself yeah i always fear for those types of videos because i feel like those are very like old school youtube videos like if i'd made those seven years before i feel like they would they'd be more popular than like new school style YouTube videos. So I think yeah. that that could also be, but then again, you know, the shmup audience is a little bit more open to old school style videos than like regular gaming audiences are too as well. Okay. So actually while we were talking here, I thought of, I thought of other things um, that I think more shmups could, or newer shmups could try, which I think are good ideas. One of them is Jamestown plus is pretty fantastic because you're going vertically, but you're using the whole screen. Ah, and also the, the you have- horizontal. So you like yeah. the vertizontal. I think that's neat. Yeah, it's a neat idea. I still like, for, I still love vertical shmups, but the the idea that you have the whole screen to play with instead of the, you know, the shrunk down piece is really neat. And the fact that you can get up to four people in there while it makes it way more difficult because there's so much stuff going on on the screen is you know it's fun with kids and people really like that. like that aspect of that game that really stands out a lot a lot of people comment to me about that is that they really like the 4p multiplayer of jamestown like that is a big selling point of that game i've noticed so the maybe other, the more other thing multiplayer that... stuff with shmup i think i think multiplayer stuff would be actually really like co-op stuff would be really cool Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, you know, like almost all shmups have the, the two player, the two player option, but very few people I know ever really use that all that much. Yeah, it's almost like it has to like for some reason, Jamestown feels like you're supposed to play a multiplayer. Right. Well, Whereas it might the other be literally shmups... designed that way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think that um, I, I remember there was this four player clear of Jamestown. That was a lot of fun to watch on this is a slam three i think it was or slam two i can't remember one of the they all blur together i think it was slam three though i'm pretty sure uh that a lot of people really got a kick out of and that it it had people playing who weren't typically shmup players like they're more uh versed with fighting games but because the one guy was like hey i want to do this you all are playing with me <laughs> like like it can you can literally drag people into the genre that way too so that mm -hmm. is a cool idea the last point i was going to make is um there is a shmup on the Switch, which I cannot think of the name of now, which tells you how much I play it, but um, it it's broken down into disjointed stages, so you don't go from one to the next to the next. And each of those disjointed stages hmm. has um, a number of uh, little goals to meet, right? Like it might be, the first one would might be like, destroy 60% of the enemies that come on the screen. The next one is 
rescue all the people. The next oh, one is sort of like sort of like WarioWare, something like that. Yeah, and I think that that gives players something to work toward within a stage without feeling like they have to try to clear it on the first try or they need a good score or right. like there's these little incentives to oh, maybe I'll try the stage again and try to get this many. Right, yeah. That's like so you like chop down the game play a little bit more and then you also add in different ways to interact with the stages. Yeah, it's like little mini achievements but yeah, within like, so you keep trying to get the next achievement which also makes you better at the game. Yeah. That is a good idea. I could see that being really successful too in like a handheld type of thing, like on the Switch mm -hmm. as a handheld. That's yeah. a good idea. It feels very mobile gamey. Yeah, exactly. Kind of yeah. Thing. Well, mobile games are killing it right now, <laughs> so there's some lessons to be learned there. As sure. as Cave will apparently tell you. Yes, as Cave can attest to. I think actually, now that you mentioned that, you just described Cave's <laughs> described Cave's mobile shmup. That's what it is. Now that you oh, mentioned really? That, yes, that's how it works. I played a little bit of it. It's all in Japanese, so it's hard to understand. But yeah, no, you do fly through the stages, and it has like Jamers knows all about it. One day I'll bring Jamers on, and he'll really explain the game. But uh, yeah, it, it, it is like that. You go through, and you like have these little mini challenges, and like one one stage will be like a boss fight. And then you get uh, like experience points and then you like level up your ships and all this stuff. Like, yeah. And that's a very successful model. So maybe they just need to translate that to English. I mean, I feel like I would definitely play this game. <laughs> yeah. Like it sounds just learn Japanese and you'll be all over. Yeah. It. <laughs> that's my ideas. Well, I think a lot of them are really, really great ideas that. And it's good to have a new perspective, too, because like I said, uh, sometimes we... Uh, like lose sight of what newer players are interested in and what they're looking for, what stands out to them, right? Like what shmups stand out to them and what shmups don't. Like for instance, Crimson Clover stood out to you, but Rolling Gunner did not. And I don't think many people would be able to predict that. A lot, maybe more people would think, oh, well, Rolling Gunner, because it's so associated in our minds with the Switch. We just assume like when you buy a Switch, you just, you're just handed a copy of Rolling Gunner with it. But uh, that's not necessarily the case, so... I'm not sure. I, I honestly have no idea what really hooked me about Crimson Clover, the look of Crimson Clover, but it got me. And it's fantastic, so I wasn't wrong. It's all that gold. That's what it is. I think it was. Stuff blows up in the gold. That gets anyone going. <laughs> it's like, right. that, someone needs to make a shmup where it just like money flies out of the enemies when it comes <laughs> to you. <laughs> Real money. Just Real, give me money. Oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> I thought it would be kind of fun if they'd made like in Japan or something like a literal gambling shmup where you put money in and then like if you get the clear or not like you get paid like the way it would work is so you'd come in and you try to clear right you put your quarter in and if you die the game keeps your quarter but if you win it'll like spit out the quarters of well a percentage of the previous players who died trying to beat the game <laughs> so you could like go and jackpot and stuff I thought that'd be obviously that wouldn't really work in real life, but that would be like kind of a, a fun idea. Guild slot machine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, awesome. Thanks for coming on, my dude. Um, Thank you. Is there a Twitter or anything you want to plug? Nope. I try to stay off social media. Oh, um, wise man. I'm a weird guy. Yeah, I'm wise, a weird guy. Not weird. Um, wise, smart. <laughs> thank you. So he's here. Yeah. He's here for purely the passion, which is really cool. Well, I and. I thank you because your um, content, your passion, I'm, I'm sure is infectious for other people as it is for me. So, uh, you know, you're, what you're doing is is excellent. Your content is helping people get into this genre, even if it's, you know, little by little. So thank you. Well, I'm really happy to hear that because it, it does blow my mind a little bit from time to time. <laughs> so that's really cool. Well, thanks so much. Adios, everyone. Yep. Thanks, Mark. Thank you to the $5 patrons, 100-100, Dingo, Another Joe, Anthony A, Aaron Iodice, Aaron Solis, Ben, 
Blur STG, Borgie 22, Brian Reboot, Brian Shiver, Bubblegum Crisis 1394, Chris Yusufovich, Chronic Burnout 3, Corey Mark, Daniel Savage, Darren Griffin, Delta Tango 6, Disco Star Slayer, DJ420, Praise It, Dubs, Entropy, Eric H, FCK, Full Set, Retro Schmupper, Hausu, Ilya, Kiwi, J Lab, JB RPG, Jim Nakam, Joe Angelo, John Kelly, Game Boy Guru, K, K2, Kiko Man 589, Larage, Malaise, Mark Toms, Maz, Megadeth 859, Minong, Mechelin, Mitch LY, Queen Charlene, Nathaniel Davis, and Electron, Neon Dagger Games, Okla Googles, Philip Mason, Portal 63, Rattlecat, Raul, Real Skeen, Riff Mason, Scanline City, Seven Overdose, Shane Sinsensky, SLW, Sniper's Paradise, The Boot Rex, The Real Ikuzo, The Dirty Screech, The Old Bensta, TRM, Sugumo, Twilight EX, Plasmo, and Yutsukaya. Thanks for watching.